Today on Mean Brews, I'm covering Belgian Dark Strong Ale or Belgian Quad. Um, I've chosen this beer because I recently, in July, won Best of Show with my recipe at the Belgian Brew Brawl in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different on this uh, video. I'm going to show where on the curves my recipe is before I share the recipe at the end. You kind of see the decisions I made and why I moved stuff around. Um, also wanted to point out for, for next week or next video, I'm going to let my patrons on Patreon uh, decide. There's a poll on Patreon for Mean Brews. Um, if you join, you can, you can participate in the poll um, and choose what beer style I'm going to cover next. Uh, finally, before we get into the data, I've got some Mean Brews merch for sale. Um, if you look in the description of this video, you'll be able to go on the merch site and get a Mean Brews shirt or a hat or whatever you like. Um, take, check that out. Take a look. Uh, don't feel obligated to buy anything, but if you want to, go ahead and do it. Let's get right into the data. I found 29 Belgian Dark Strong Ale recipes. Uh, two were best of show. One was mine. Uh, 17 gold, 4 silver, 5 bronze, and 1 that was just award winning. The BJCP style is 26D, a dark complex, very strong Belgian ale with a delicious blend of malt richness, dark fruit flavors, and spicy element. Complex, rich, smooth, and dangerous. Um, when I look at both of the evolution and the and the variation between the recipes, uh, there is some, and we'll present those, but nothing like Saison last week. Original gravity, um, big range, 1.065 to 1.110, outside of BJCP. Um, the mean was 1.092, and my recipe was 1.099. I was shooting for 1.092, I just overshot my... Uh, uh, my, my simple sugars, I think. Um, BJCP range for IBUs, anywhere between 20 and 35. Um, we had recipes all over the board here. Average was 32. Mine was 44 as calculated by Brewfather, um, but it's 32 and calculated by Beersmith. They're both supposed to use the Tinseth uh, equations. I'm not sure. Probably some setting I've got in Brewfather that I haven't... Um, I'm only just now starting to use that. Um, I would trust more the the 32 range for what I was actually achieving with my uh, with my recipe. SRM somewhere between 13 and 33, with an average of 22. Um, mine was at 32 and a half. Um, so very dark example, and the reason is we're seeing a big evolution here. Um, so the, the the style is evolving with a pretty strong correlation coefficient, um, increasing in darkness over time. There was mine right there. Um, sorry, yeah, 29 was mine. Average malt proportions, 78% base malt, 7.1% crystal, 3.7 toast, 0.4 roast, and 10.8% adjuncts. Um, looking at this, and, and really, I know it's confusing, but just look at the uh, trend lines. Um, the first one we'll look at is crystal malts. It is the black curve. Um, we're seeing with a pretty good correlation, a decrease in crystal malts, a decrease in toasted malts, and a decrease in roasted malts, while we're seeing a slight increase, not as strong of a correlation, but a slight increase uh, in simple sugars. And what I think this is, is people are trending towards, you know, there's some classic recipes that are just base malt and and dark crystal. Um, people are trending more towards dark candy sugar, sorry. And people are trending more towards the classical um, recipes, which this was uh, typically just that, and maybe a little bit of uh, chocolate or carafa thrown in for color. I will look at the malt distributions again. This is if they use the malts, um, how much was used. Uh, the bar, the pie chart just is, is even if they didn't use it, it's factored in. Gives you a little bit more data. Um, looking at the um, base malts, we had somewhere between 60 and less, a little less than 90% of the grist with an average of about you know, 70, 77 or 80, somewhere around there. Um, looking at the other malts, um, we have um, our adjunct, which is uh, the yellow curve. 
somewhere above 90% using adjuncts at somewhere around between 10 and 15%. Um, crystal malts, we had somewhere around 90, 90 to 100% using crystal malts. A lot of recipes using crystal malts. Somewhere between 5 and 10, probably about 7.5%. Uh, average toasted malts, even though they're growing down, more than 60% of the recipes use toasted malts. At an average of between probably about 6% of the grist. Um, and for toast, roasted malts, um, still a big proportion, more than 40% of the recipes using a, a roasted malt. Somewhere around 1% of the grist. I didn't zoom in on this slide, but... Uh, We'll, we'll cover it in more detail. Base malts, the most prominent was Pilsner malt. 100% uh, of the recipes used some sort of Pilsner or Pale malt. I just grouped them together. Uh, an average of 70% of the grist. Um, Munich was the most, uh, next most common. 41% of the recipes used a Munich malt at an average of 12% of the grist. Uh, wheat malt, 34% of the recipes used a wheat malt at an average of 5% of the grist. Um, last one was Vienna. Less than 20% use Vienna. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for this style. Oh, my recipe was right here on the main <laughs> for Pilsner. And right on the low side for wheat and on the low side for Munich. The reason is I use a lot more complex malts. And, the, and I think the contributions these add were really factored in from the, the specialty malts that I use. Um, percentage of Pilsner, this again correlates to the simple sugar. Base malt and simple sugar, you're seeing an increase in time of, of Pilsner use. And I think that kind of shows people are trending towards that very simple recipe of, you know, simple sugars and base malts just for this style. Crystal malts, uh, most prominent is Special B. 86% of the recipes use Special B at an average of 3.9% of the grist. The next most prominent was a medium crystal. 55% of the recipes used a medium crystal and an average of 4.5% of the grist. Also had care pills and light crystal. Um, where I stacked up is pretty close to the mean on special B and a little bit less than the mean on crystal. Um, I think on these, the reason why I'm lower than the mean is because I added some more data to my data set between when I brewed it and when I'm presenting this, which kind of bumped these up higher. Um, at the time when I brewed it, these were the mean values. Pretty close to the mean now, but uh, those have increased a little bit. Toast and roast malts, um, most prominent is aromatic. 45% of the recipes used a Belgian aromatic malt at an average of 4.1% of the grist. Uh, chocolate malt, 41% uh, of the recipes used a chocolate or a carafa or a carafa special malt at an average of 1% of the grist. Um, where I am... Uh, I used a victory, uh, a victory malt here on the low end of the, the curve, and I did use a chocolate malt again on the low end of the curve. Uh, low end here for color. Uh, it's, mine was very dark, and I didn't want to exceed going to the... Uh, I'm already in the dark brown zone. I didn't want to go into the black. Um, it's really not appropriate for the style. And right on the average for aromatic. Just under the average for aromatic. Um... Adjuncts, lots of different adjuncts, not as many as Saison, but lots of different ones. Um, the most prominent was a dark candy sugar or a D180. 62% of the recipes used dark candy, an average of 8.4% of the grist. And sucrose was the next most prominent. 31% of the reci recipes used sucrose at an average of 6.8% of the grist. Um, then we had amber candy sugar here, clear candy sugar here, flake, and then your flakes and other sugars. Um, where am I on this? Oh yeah, I am Andy, Amber Candy, 21% of the recipes at 5.7% of the grist. And then we'll get into where I am. I use ribbon cane syrup. I found this in a country store in the south. Um, it's basically, ribbon cane is an heirloom variety of sugar cane. And the cane syrup is similar to just regular cane syrup. It has, it's not as dark as molasses. Um, it's, it's not as harsh as molasses. I thought it would be a good compliment. I replaced my sucrose with ribbon cane syrup to add some complexity. And I went pretty low on the D180 because this has some, you know, residual dark sugar elements to it. Um, and it paid off, obviously. So I will continue to use ribbon cane syrup. I've got some in my pantry right now. 
every time I go back home to Oklahoma, I go pick it up from this country store. So um, try some different sugars. Uh, sorghum syrup is another good one. Um, you know, there's there's a bunch of different sugars. Um, Pilloncillo, Turbinado. This is one where you can really play around, and it's appropriate for the style. So don't feel obligated to find ribbon cane syrup. If you can't and you want to replicate my recipe, go with just sucrose, table sugar, and bump up the D180 back to the average. Bittering hops, most prominent with Styrian Golines, followed by Magnum, Haller, uh, Northern Brewer, and some others. Um, doesn't really matter, so I used DKG. It was what I had. Um, feel free to use any of these um, in your recipe. Flavor hops, uh, Styrian Golding's most prominent, followed by Sots, Tetnang, Herzbrucker, Haller, Northern Brewer, and Pearly. All continental hops, European continental hops. Some noble, some not. I, I'm not. I don't have any flavor hops in my recipe. Roma hops, Styrian Golding's, Herzbrucker, Fuggles, and Northern Brewer. Sots, Willamette, and Spalt were the hops used for aroma hops. And again, I don't have any recipes that or any of these aroma hops used in my recipe. Uh, for the rate of hop additions, let's see, 38% of the recipes used a flavor hop at an average of 0.16 ounces per gallon, big range between 0.05 and 0.3. Um, aroma hops, 35% of the recipes use an aroma hop at an average of 0.17 ounces per gallon or 1.27 grams per liter. Another big range of about the same, 0.05 to 0.3. I didn't use either of these in mine. And the reason is we're seeing a decrease in the usage of late hops for this style over time, uh, falling under the threshold where I would use them. So this is why I didn't in my recipe. We're also seeing a decrease in, in those recipes that did use a flavor hop addition, the amount that they use. So contribution here, this is a beer meant to be aged, and I'll show that in a slide. Um, they're just getting that, that flavor and aroma hop is just going to fade away to nothing. And I think it's a detriment to the, the style very early on when it's young. Uh, mash type, I think we have one decoction mash, quite a few step mashes, and the majority were single infusion mashes. Uh, I did do a step mash for this uh, recipe. Mash rests, 23% um, did a protein rest at an average of 127.5 or 53 Celsius for an average duration of 19 minutes. Um, about a third did a beta rest at 142.6 Fahrenheit or 61.5 Celsius for an average of about 30 minutes. And then for the alpha rest, the average temperature was 152.7 Fahrenheit or 67 Celsius for an average of an hour. Um, I was on the high end of the protein rest. I didn't have a lot of heavily laden protein malts and grains in my grain bill. I wanted to do a, a protein rest um, and I kind of wanted to get uh, maximum fermentability. So I went very high on this, um, very high on the... Um, Beta rest, 146, and then at 154 for my um, alpha rest. So you kind of see where I was on this curve. Boil duration, anywhere between 30 minutes and 120 minutes. 94 was the mean, and I was at 90 minute, a 90 minute boil, mainly just to get the gravity, um, post boil gravity that I needed out of this style. All right, the yeast used, this is where it gets fun. Evenly split 38% between the Chimay and the West Mall strain. Roquefort um, was third with 14%. And then we had a Chauf Duvel. I'm not sure what brewery this is. This is Yeast 3739. Some English strains. An English strain, S33. Uh, Sam Adams strain was in one recipe. And then a Saison strain. Uh, one recipe used a Saison strain. Um, I used the Chimay strain for my recipe. Water chemistry, um, calcium, the average was 68, magnesium, 7, sodium, 35, sulfate, 52, and chloride, 73. Um, I was a little bit higher than the average on calcium, lower on magnesium, lower on sodium, very low on sulfates, and very high on chlorides. I wanted to accentuate the malty characteristics of this style. 
Um, fermentation temperatures, again, I'm splitting into starting temperature, average starting temperature, and average finishing temperature. So for all the recipes, the average was 68 Fahrenheit. And for the Chimay, the um, West Mall, and the Roquefort, really pretty much there. This one was, uh, Chimay was right at 67. Uh, West Mall was right at 68 and a half and um, 67 and a half for Roquefort. Where did they finish? Oh, where was I? I fermented, I started at 68 on the blue curve as my root, my yeast. Um, where did they finish? The average was uh, 77 Fahrenheit or 25 Celsius. Again, the blue curve is Chimay and I finished at 78. Red curve, quite um, interesting to see such a big sweep here for um, the West Mall strain, again finishing at 78. And only one recipe reported a finishing temperature of 72 for uh, the Roquefort strain. All right, so I brewed my beer in on the 25th of March, 2019, and I entered quite a few competitions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I'm going to enter three more. I've got six more bottles left. So uh, 12 total I will enter, and you can see the first round average score that I've received from this beer when it was brewed, um, these are the dates of the competition, and these are the uh, resulting scores. Um, the scale is 0 to 50. If you've seen the BJCP scale, 50 is a perfect beer. Um, world class perfect. Highest I've scored was 46. My best to show beer was a 46. I've had three above 40s, which is an excellent, excellent score for any beer. I've, I've received three medals, three golds, and a best to show. Um, when you get best of show, you also get a gold. So you can see the effect of age here. And when this beer gets good is really, these are six month increments, really not until six year, 18 months, is it really passable as a Belgian dark strong. Um, I find this very telling. This curve, this trend is, trend line is a pretty good fit. Um, this score was 27. I thought it was good back then. Obviously the judges are blind. They don't know whose it is. I had a friend that judged this beer at a competition and um, I trust him immensely on his ability to judge beers and assign that score of 27. Um, very happy with the best of show. Um, again, just to show you the effect of age. And there's quite a few styles where this uh, curve really fits. We heavy, any barley wines, any really big dark beer will benefit from age, uh, Russian Imperial Stout. Um, so keep in mind that the, that your beer will not will not peak until at least 18 months after uh, you brewed it. Other variables, carbonation volumes, the average was 2.9. I think I hit 2.9, and the average mash pH was 5.5. All right, so I'm not going to share a mean brews recipe. I'm going to share the recipe that won best of show at the Belgian Brew Brawl, um, and let's go. Uh, I used 69.2% Belgian Pilsner malt, 6.3% uh, ribbon cane syrup, 5% D180. Um, this is the traditional. I add the, added these as the spice, really. <laughs> it's a lot of grains, but uh, it does well. I've done really well with this. Uh, Munich 1, 4.5%. Uh, aromatic, 3.9%. Caramunich, 35 That's the medium crystal. Special B, 3.5%. Um, I did add biscuit um, at around 2%. You don't have to. The data doesn't show that it's prominent. Uh, wheat malt 1.7, and just for color, a little bit Carafa special. If your color is already there, leave this out. It's it's not going to add a big flavor contribution. Uh, for my hops, I used around 44. What's calculated by um, Brewfather is 44 IBUs, 30 in Beersmith, uh, 2.23 ounces of, or 0 0.41 ounces per gallon of East Kent Golings at 6% alpha acids. Um, and I used a uh, WLP 500 with about a two liter. Actually, this beer was actually, the beer was racked onto a double, um, that a, a cake for a double that I had made earlier. So I pitched very, very big. Um, so you should pitch very big as well. Original Gravity came out at 1.099 with IBUs either, either one you believe. I think 30 is probably more prominent. 30 for Beersmith, 44 for Brewfather. Both were calculated per tensith. My water chemistry, I shared this before. 74 calcium, 3 magnesium, 29 um, sodium, 
103 chloride, 29 sulfate, and 103 bicarbonate. Uh, mash pH was 5.48 as measured. Um, I step mashed 137 for 15 minutes, 146 for 30, 154 for 30. The Celsius units are here if you want to see them. Um, and I sparge and I boiled for, sorry I didn't fix this. I boiled for 90 minutes. Boil as, as long as you need to hit that original gravity. Don't put the simple sugars in until late um, at flame out or close to flame out. Um, don't want to scorch them on your kettle. I chilled to 68, oxygenate and pitch a minimum of a, this in a five gallon batch, it's a two liter starter. So that's 0 0.4 liters per gallon starter. Um, I fermented at 68 and I allowed it to free rise up to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, crash and transfer to a bottle. Condition, mine was 2.9 volumes of CO2. This is, if you're bottle conditioning, you have to use a bottle conditioning yeast. These, this yeast poops out at this ABV and will not carb. I've done two batches. I had a friend do a batch of this exact recipe. Same results. You must use a CBC one when you're priming uh, to bottle condition or uh, this yeast will not carbonate in the bottle at this ABV. All right, that's it um, for the next uh, style next week. We are going to use what Patreon votes for. So if you want to participate, join the Patreon, buy me a beer, basically. Uh, join me at the lowest level, $3, and you can, you can vote in the poll. So until then, we'll see you in a week. Bye-bye.